Okay, my outstandingly wonderful friends. This is going to be a very interesting presentation, I hope. We're going to study, or we're going to just discuss what the difference is between rocks and minerals and dirt and clay and crystals and all that business. What, what is the difference? Well, here's what they say in the U uh, United States Geological Survey. They say that a mineral is a naturally occurring inorganic element. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you that that's not correct or compound having orderly internal structure and characteristic chemical composition, crystal form, physical properties, common mineral including quartz, feldspar, mica, amphibile, olivine, and calcite. You see these minerals? Those are the minerals of life. What we are looking at here is biology that was, I mean it's biology, it's now geology. And I'm going to tell you what, where do you hear who knew this 100, over a hundred years ago and who was in charge of Yale at that time in their geology and made these statements. And these are exactly his statements, only he said they were biological geological formations, not inorganic, nothing to do with biology. He said, yes, they were biology. And all of this stuff, even though you see these fancy little crystals and all these different things. All of this stuff is from from a, a, a creature's body. Now they petrify in different ways according to the conditions that were, they were in when they were entombed. Some of them turn into literally almost like glass. Some of them turn into something similar to this with a whole bunch of holes in it. Wherever there was bodily fluids, they now are empty. Some of them, the bone just turns into stone. That was a bone. The head of a bone, now it's a stone. Some of them, the meat stays exactly like it was when it was meat. You, you could take a bite out of that if you had good enough teeth. Sometimes the goose will be cooked. <laughs> this is my Caesar, my buddy Caesar, Caesar Augustus. And what happened was there was a hot, a very, very hot salt water flood because we were almost impacted by Venus. All recorded only 3,500 years ago. Look up Velikowski, you'll find out. One side of all my mud fossils are flat like that because they died in a, in a great hot water flood, parboiled, continuously watery solutions flowing through, and then the stuff that would rot turn stable because of a process called nucleophilic invasion and substitution. These new molecules came down and they said, hey, you guys are going to fall apart if you don't, we don't hook up together. And they said, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, I'll bond with you. And I said, well, how are you going to do that? We say, you, you are a collagen. Collagen has a certain chemistry to it that looks for aluminum silicates. You see right here, feldspar? <laughs> that's feldspar, that's feldspar, that's feldspar, that's feldspar. All of this is feldspar, all of the collagens. And there are a ton of collagens in you. All your connective tissues, all of your fascia, your skin, your hair, everything that separates anything from anything else is collagen. Now, let's, let's take a, a look deeper into this. But everybody loves minerals and rocks. Everybody's crazy about them. I, I feel like everybody just loves them, but they don't understand them yet. We have new species. New species called notos. But it's a, it's a stone. Say, so, oh, that can't be a, that, that's not biology, that's a stone. Well, it was biology at one time. And I know the process, as I just told you. It is continuous invasion for over a long period of time from a hot water flood. I've made these. They're not hard to make, and it doesn't take all that long. So, you know, this is something very, very easy to prove. And I have already DNA tested and everything on that. But that's been DNA tested. It's a lung. That's a lung. It's a human lung. It is a human. And I took the DNA out of somewhere down here, drilled a hole in there, and took some really good, solid DNA. As they said, it was the DNA was excellent. And the same thing here. Flat as a pancake because it died in the flood. And all of this feldspar, this is feldspar too. 
All right, so we got a little thinking to do here, and I'm trying to approach the people that we we look to for answers about this, to, to discuss this, and I'm having a hard time getting anybody that wants to discuss it because it really messes up everything they've been saying. But it goes back to 150 years ago. Watch this. This is crazy. Okay, so here we go, my friends. As I was saying, we're trying to determine what are minerals, what are rocks, and I got sent this by a friend of mine, Pedro, my good friend, and he's, this is the composition of rocks, minerals, crystallinity, and bonding types. Professor Dave explains, this is the channel, when I saw this, my jaw dropped. Where do you see this? All right, here we go. What is a mineral? This was very good. Professor Dave, thank you. Fair use act, mineral, my friend. Depends on who you ask. Nutritionists might use the word mineral to describe elements like calcium and zinc, which are found in certain types of foods or supplements. Biologists might define a mineral as any inorganic material present within a living organism. But how do geologists define minerals? James D. Dana, an American geologist who created the first standardized classification system for over 5,000 minerals in... All right, this guy's name is James D. Dana. He died in 1895, but he had the first classification system, which still holds up, except they removed one, well, they removed three letters. <laughs> Watch this. In the 1850s, defined a mineral as a naturally occurring solid chemical substance formed through biogeochemical processes having characteristic chemical composition, highly ordered atomic structure, and specific physical properties. What did they remove? B-I-O. They are now geochemical processes. Well, he knew that they were from biology, bio-geochemical processes. And what is characteristic comp composition? Well, feldspar. One of the main, main things in the whole earth is feldspar. And it is, as I probably have already told you, is collagens that have bonded with aluminum silicates. The chemical composition, aluminum silicates, characteristic is feldspar. I understand the biogeochemical processes. It's nucleophilic invasion under high salt water, high temperature floods. Highly ordered structure, no question whatsoever. Specific physical properties, absolutely. These, these, these things right here in front of you are body parts of creatures, and they are minerals. And they are also rocks. There's no difference. All right, so I went ahead and looked up James Dwight Dana. Now, here's what they have to say about him. He lived from 1813 to 1895. The field of geology is studded by many notable names that anyone would recognize in a heartbeat. One great name, though, that isn't heard of very often is that of James Dwight Dana. During his life, he made massive contributions to the field of geology, mineralogy, volcanology, zoology. He pioneered the study of mountain building, the origin and structure of the continents, oceans, volcanic activity. Indeed, he was a man that proved to be relentless in his desire to understand the earth. Me too, buddy. It's me and you there, James, and we're going to do this thing together. Now, the crazy thing is, he was one of the top dogs at Yale. His father-in-law was a Silman, and he was, um, he actually went, well, here it is. In 1830, James graduated high school and enrolled in Yale, where he studied under the elder Benjamin Silman. And James Dana graduated from Yale and so forth. And anyway, he lived in New Haven, and he ended up marrying Silman's daughter. And they, and when Silman retired, he took over <laughs> as as the successor to the the head of the geology department at Yale. And his comments were, "Everything is ge biology." So they wrote him out of history. And don't forget, this is in quotes. This is a, a direct statement by this game guy, James Dana. 
biogeochemical processes. Right? These are biogeology. That's what I've been talking about for a very long time now, that all of these things, they're not just rocks. They are, they, you can call them whatever you want to call them. It doesn't matter to me. They, and they can preserve in a whole variety of ways. This right here is a lung. All of the alveoli have emptied out. The blood didn't fill up and it didn't fill up with quartz. This one, nothing happened to it at all. The, the pleura, which is the feldspar, coated this and preserved it. This doesn't have any feldspar on it. This is down inside the, the actual organ and where the blood is. You see that? That's red blood in here. This is the fabric. It might even actually be collagen because your lungs have to do this. Any Collagens are stretchy, rubbery fabrics. And your, your lung is coated with this pleura, which is a, like a, just a rubber bag. And it goes like this all day long, every day, as long as you're breathing oxygen, it's got to expand and come back. And I think some of these flus and so forth are attacking the collagens. That's why you, you can't get your, your, uh, your lungs to open up. And you have to be intubated with oxygen and force it into you. Now, anyway, that's a whole other issue. But anything can turn into anything. That's the key. Like, this is a heart. All right, that's a heart. Turn it to almost solid glass. This also, oh, i got another one around here somewhere. This just turned into a red, a, a red piece of meat, really, because it, well, here's, here's, here's one here. This is just a piece of meat. I can't find a heart. It doesn't matter. This is a piece of meat. And that right there is a flap of collagen, and that's the fascia that coated it. And it's just a chunk of meat, and because of the... The particular conditions it was in, it preserved just like it was in the body. I can't account for all of this. I do know it's nucleophilic substitution that invades and, and replaces the molecules that were inside there with something that stabilizes and makes them stable. And it only happens in aqueous hot water floods. All right? And then it has to... They have to be in there for a long time. The waters have to bring in all the new molecules. The old molecules got to get out of there. And then, eventually, all of that moisture goes off and has to be washed out. And all of these aggressive chemicals, the salts and acids, have to be flushed from whatever invaded them. And then they dry out, and that's what you get is, is the body parts of these creatures. And usually they're laying on not like that. You know, they have to lay somewhere. They're going to be this way or that way or whatever. Wherever they're laying, there you get the flat spot. As I've been showing very, very clearly, you can't miss that. I mean, how could you possibly miss this? This is a lung. It's been DNA tested, CAT scan. It's an anatomist verified. I mean, it has all of the patterns of the pleura. And this is feldspar. So, I'm going to tell you right now, collagen is feldspar. And it is a mineral. And it has a chemical substance formed, which is aluminum silicates. I'll show you feldspar aluminum silicates. It has a process that, that created this. It's a nucleophilic invasion. It has characteristics and co chemical composition, just like I told you. It's highly ordered atomic structure, yes. Specific physical properties, absolutely. Stretchy and rubbery. And all these little flakes are in there. All right, let's take a look at feldspar. Now, remember Professor Dana's words about the chemical substance and the bio-geochemical processes. I read his whole history, and it is impressive. He did everything. Biology, geology, zoology. He went through or everywhere in the world and collected samples. He brought back enough samples, they said, to last him 13 years of sitting around looking at them. I got the same thing here. You, I go, my, my backyard is where I get all my stuff from. I, I am in an a, a exact place where all of this stuff, it must have been on a rise, and it, it's clean waters washed it out just after they dry you know after the flood receded and washed it out and got rid of all the salts and acids and then they became solid because i'm gonna tell you what this lung right here if it was petrified in salt water it would just 
dissolve. And I could prove that. You want to see it? I'll show you. It would be, it, when it came out of the salt water, it looked like just like a fresh lung. And then about a week later, it would become dust. And that's what happened to almost, well, that's what clay is from. Anyway, here goes. Okay, so here is feldspar. Feldspar is by far the most abundant group of minerals in Earth's crust forming 60% of terrestrial rocks. Well, let me tell you something. As far as I could determine, there is nothing that is not biological. And 60% is probably pretty close to what your body has for collagen in it. Because all of your connective tissues, all of your fabric in your body, your skin, your hair, your I mean, just about everything that connects anything to anything, tendons, it's all this feldspar, aluminum silicates. Now, I have a selection here of a bunch of different things, and I know what they are. This is no question, this is a lung. It's been DNA tested, and, and this is feldspar right here. The, this goose, if you can understand what a goose looks like and what feathers look like, you understand that's a goose. And I have already drilled into his uh, artery here and done the catalase test on the blood, and that proved positive. This is a no-toe. This foot that's in the microscope right now. I'll show it to you again after I take it out of the microscope. I have also a lung here that came through space. A lung. This has feldspar on it. Still some. Because it's burnt off most of it, but it still has some. This is a bone. That's a bone. It's turned into a stone, but it also has feldspar. Now, we may even be able to find a little tiny taste of feldspar on this, which is a, a heart. That's a heart. It's turned to glass. It depends on the chemistry of the place where it was entombed. Was it heavy with transition metals? This wasn't. There's no transition metals there at all. Completely clean, washed out everything. This one had all of the transition metals it needed to stabilize like a piece of meat. It's just what happens, and there's no telling what's going to happen except for certain areas have certain chemistry, and all of the stuff in that area will have similar characteristics. And I have stuff, I, I have so much stuff, I just can't even start to talk to you about it. But let's look at what feldspar is, because like I said, I have it in the microscope right now, and this is feldspar. And all this stuff is feldspar, and it's, like I said, 60% of the terrestrial rocks. Alright, I showed you I have this lung here, and that's 100% dense feldspar. This one, all of the pleura and the, the feldspar are gone, and it, 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 it just was, you know, eroded away. And it's down to the alveoli, and these little red spots in here actually had blood coming out of them. You see that? This is the feldspar. You see that? How, and I'm going to show you in the microscope other things that look just like this feldspar. And I know there's no question that came from a lung, so we don't have to worry about that. That's bio, bio, biological. No. And this one is as well, only it turned into quartz. And you see where the alveoli holes are here? Instead of them going staying open, which they should because that's where the air goes, it filled up with quartz. That's why they're always talking about quartz, too. Quartz and feldspar, it's all fine together. Well, this one had the alveoli just stayed open like holes, like, like where the air goes, yes. But there's still a lot of red blood in here. And this is all this is is the fabric of the lung. The, the pleura's gone, the fascia's gone, everything's gone down to simply the structure of the lung. Missing all of these little things, the, 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 the quartz has invaded this one. Quartz didn't invade this one. That's why I always talk about veins of quartz. What all they are is literally veins and arteries. They fill in holes. That's what quartz do, it fills in holes. Just like this, it filled in all the holes where this heart was. That, all of that is heart strings and ventricle walls. And, trust me, I, I know exactly what this is. And other ones will fill in with transition metals. Instead of the heart becoming like a, a piece of glass, like this is, it will actually look just exactly like it did when it was alive. Let me show you that, because I want to really prove myself. That it's time to get this proved and 
taking a look at in reality instead of just ignoring what, what I'm showing. This is, I've done a lot of work on this and I have the DNA tests and all of that stuff. So, and, and this lung came through space and it's, it's, a, it's a metallic lung, it's heavy. And it's still got pleura on it. I'll show you those. It's still got some fascia on here. Most of it's burnt off because it's cheap. It burns off easy. But then you get down to the metals, which is where you have your iron and so forth. And then it becomes magnetic because that's what, you know, iron meteorites, they're, whoops. They, they, they smelt. If you talk to anybody that's into metallurgy, they know that what happens is the hotter it gets, the more cheap stuff cooks off and the more it turns into iron and metals. All different metals, but this, all these holes here, basically are almost the same holes as these right here. This is a lung, I guarantee you that, 100%, and I can find the latch that holds this lung in position. It's right there. I'll show you this in a microscope, but, and, and I'll show you the pleura at the same time, which was just same as this, only most of it burnt off. I have other meteorites here too. That, um, the same thing happened. They're small enough that everything didn't burn off, but most of it burnt off. That's just the nature of coming through the atmosphere. Okay, I should explain about the veins of quartz and how they fill in voids. That the quartz fills in voids. It just fills them in. As a matter of fact, there's one in here. That's be it's right. This one right here is being invaded right now with quartz. I'll show that in the microscope. That one right there. Alright, I gotta remember to show you that. Now, also, this foot, this is a foot from some creature no, nobody knows about. They're called no-toes. That's what I call them. Now, I have, this has had the same feldspar as is on that lung. Identical. Now, I have to turn off the lights so that you'll be able to see it in the scope. But if you look up here, you see what you're looking at right there? All right? What are you looking at right there? Same exact stuff. That's in a microscope. It's identical to that, which is this foot right here. That's the foot. Hold on. All right? That's the foot. And that's what it looks like in the microscope. See, now I, I can't, can't have all these lights going on at the same time and see it. Now, let's take another look at it. All right, this again, feldspar. You see all the little flakes? This is actually going to fill in with quartz. It's a blood vessel, apparently. Now, all of this is the pleura. Well, it's actually this they call, um, it's a coating on the, the, the bones. Oh boy, I can't remember the name of it, but the, the, the ancients used to call it tunica, which is, means a wrapping of the bones, and it was a, and this is the bone right here, i got to turn the lights on again so you can see it, hold on. That's the bone. It was in the microscope right there. Anybody that's an anatomist, I mean, I've, I've had an anatomist look at that, nobody could question that. Can't be questioned. This is the only last bit of bone that remains. I'm going to put that in a microscope and show you what, what is left after nucleophilic invasion. That's it right there. Hold on. All right, there's a microscope looking right down at that piece of bone. The last little tip of bone that's in there. Here it is up here. That's it. That whole bone, that's the last, last, tiniest taste of bone that exists because it's been completely invaded. That's the process. You look it up, nucleophilic substitution, nucleophilic invasion. Well, let's just look at it quick. All right, I'm doing this sort of freehand, but you see those little black squiggles right there? This little black squiggle over here? You can find them all over the place if you look for them. You see there's another one over there? Let me home in on that and see if we can get a better look at it. You see how that line, you know what that is? That's a vein. That's where the vein blood gets carried back. The red blood, you see all over here, this really red, red blood? That's artery blood. Hold on, let me see if I can. 
Anyway, this is the rock that looks like a piece of meat. And I mean, it looks like a piece of meat. You see, here's some more veins running through. You have to you have arteries and veins. You've got to bring in the good blood. You've got to take the old, bad blood back. Now, all of this is really would be considered feldspar as well. It's connective tissue. Even though it doesn't look like the other feldspar, it's the white flaky parts that are in the feldspar, like you see here. You see these white flaky parts? Look. That's what feldspar is. It has that, a ton of that white flaky stuff. You see, it? It's, that's, that looks almost identical to that. <laughs> but anyway, it's all through your body. It's everywhere. Everywhere you have connective tissue is in muscles and tendons and all, everywhere. Literally everywhere. It's collagen. That's why it's 60% of everything. All right, I'm trying to remember all the claims I made. <laughs> This one here, I claim, is having a, a, a crystal growing inside of it this lung. And that's why that other lung I showed you, well, it's here and on this, right here. That's why, whoops, that's why this lung is filled with quartz. This would do the same thing. It would fill up with quartz just like this did if it was in a different condition. But only we have one little one here. That's only, the only one I could find on this one that's filling up with quartz is that one right there. So I'm going to show you that, and then I'm going to show you that a heart can look just like a heart instead of a piece of glass. My heart has turned to glass. Okay, that's the lung, the, the one that was all eroded away and has no pleura left on it. And here it is in the microscope. Now check this out. This is really cool. You see that? That's one of the alveoli of the lung. And the alveoli is the, this hole here. And what does it do? It brings in oxygen from the air and transfers it into the red blood that's in this circular hole. And all you see all these little quartz? You see all this? This is all quartz. And this is going to grow crystals. And it'll turn like this one here. It, it, if it was in the right conditions, it would go, end up just like that one. Exactly like that. Because that is nothing more than a lung as well. And this one here had a different condition. The one over here was in the... Uh, was in a, a totally different condition in the, uh, in the ground. And I, I got to remember to show you the one that erodes right away, too. I better show you these things before I forget. <laughs> but this is what happens. They fill in with quartz, uh, with quartz attaching to blood. That's why you find all these veins of quartz. They, love, they, they attach to blood. Quartz, SI, uh, silicon dioxide, it's, that's what happens. Now, the black is the black of vein blood. And this is... Uh, this is just the lung. This is the fabric of the lung, the webbing of the lung. And this blood is just saturated throughout this lung. That's what they do. And these are all the holes that run through. There's the big hole right there. I put a little water on it because the water brings out the color nicely. See this white stuff here? Hold on. Let me see if I can focus in. You see, that could be collagen, too. That could be some kind of fabric. Or, I don't know exactly what it is. But I know the pleura, the complete coating that like, you can see on the other ones, is completely gone. So, whether it's got a lot of collagens left in it, I don't know. They could very well be. It's got a structure. Almost everything that you have that's structural is loaded with collagens. The bones are a little different. Bones... Uh, you know, you got a lot of collagens mixed in with the bones, but it's mostly, I believe, calciums and potassium and uh, phosphates and different structural, you know, um, crystalline forms that make up pretty solid formations. All your, all of this stuff is gooey. Your your um, collagens are gooey. They're gummy. They're gooey. They're stretchy. They can bend. Tendons they bend. They're tough as hell, but they bend, and they move around. Everything is that's the purpose of collagens. They're a flexible fabric, and that's a flexible as hell. All right. Now here's a blow up of this rock when it first came out of the ground, and that's the fabric of what's called fascia, 
And this is, I call this a spurlock. <laughs> you see this thing here? I find these on all the lungs, all my lungs have them, all my chunks of body parts have them. And what they do is that's, that latch locks it into another part of the body so it can move around, but it will always come back to where that lock, latch invests. Now, let me show you one in a biological creature that still shows it pretty active here. You see that? There's exactly the same latch. It's that latch right there. It's hard to see in this one. It's all dirty, but that's the same latch. And you see all these? These are the collagen fibers. That's what your body's made of. And that's what the, all of these, that's what all these things are made of, the same stuff. Okay, so my claim is that this is a meteorite, came through space, and smelt it on its way, which cooked it up enough to make, make it magnetic. Now, let's, let's look at this in the microscope. I'm going to put a little water on where to take a look at it in the microscope. Now, it is obviously, you just saw, it's, it's magnetic. Now, it's small enough that it didn't burn up completely, and we're going to be able to see some of the feldspar. And I'm also going to show you the little latch that I talk about, because this was, oops, this was a lung. That's why lungs and hearts and so forth coming through space, they turn into metal because they're, they're just saturated with metal. This is like iron. Iron is, is blood. Iron is blood. All your blood is iron. FeO2 and FeO3. People say, oh, Roger, iron in the blood is Fe2O2 and Fe2O3. I say, well, yeah, that's right. The oxygen burns off. So you end up with the iron. That's why the iron. And the higher you get in temperature, the more the stuff burns off. So... This one, because it's so small, the impact value wasn't enough to smelt it. It's, it's like a big one would just turn it to 100% iron. This still has some biology in it. And it, I mean literally biology. It has some still, it will activate with catalase. I mean with uh, hydrogen peroxide. The catalase enzymes that are biological, that are still in here, will activate. All right, this is a rock a friend of mine found, Gary Evans, over in England, and it has still a little bit of feldspar on it, and it was in a mud flat. So he picks it up and breaks it open, and here's what he found. <laughs> he finds a lung inside. These are all the, the same thing that I talk about as a lung. Now, this one here, still had the black blood and the red blood is, is the blood. It was still saturated with blood. And what happened in a salt flat, in, in a, a, a muddy salt flat, and I know this was in salt or acids, but I'm sure it was salt, um, salt water. What happens is if it's encased in mud, mud is nothing more than flesh. This thing didn't even know it's out of a body while it's still in the mud and in a little bitty salty conditions. It continues to be almost like it didn't know it was dead. <laughs> All of the flesh around it stayed around it. And now you got salts and so forth invading it. But it's still, you can see, it's just like perfect now. But it eventually, it, well, here's what happens. He took it out of the ground. Gary took it out, broke it open. And this is what he found. Now, what happened after a couple of weeks? You see that? That's the same lung after, I think it was a week or two. As soon as it dried up, everything just turns to dust. And these are the different colors of the blood, the black, the red, and the yellow. These are the different colors. And you're going to see these. Let me show you something another friend of mine found, Phil Harris. He found a heart. He cracked it open, and the blood was still very fresh inside. You see that? He saw that little red spot, and he whacked it with a hammer, broke open. And that was what is inside. And after about an hour or two, here's what happened. It's called oxidation. Blood is in you to, to change oxidation states. It brings in oxygen, and then it takes out carbon dioxide. And it also transfers all kinds of metals and so forth. But primarily, if it hits oxygen, it goes into, into this. I'll show you what happens. All right, this is after an hour or two hours, something like that. The actual red blood, which was oxygenated, it had the extra oxygen, gave up oxygen, and it became the deoxygenated blood. There's a, a, there's a three oxygen blood and a two oxygen blood. It went from the three, which is red, to the two, which is dark. <laughs> 
And that's what happened within an hour or two. That's how how much changes can happen to blood almost instantaneously. It's a carrier of all of those different transition metals. I show this many, 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 many times. All of these metals are in your body, in your blood. Well, you know what? I'm going to show you again because I have to show you about the heart anyway. Boy, this works out perfect. You see all these colors? That's blood. This is literally blood. And you see all these oxidation, ace, oxidation states? That means I can give up things and I can take things on. Uh, those are like little magnets. Literally, like they are literally little magnets. And according to the way the molecule is designed, it clicks. All right, so if it comes through your body, I'm going to just show you because I sort of figured this out too. These molecules are very complicated. They have a whole batch of chemistry. But once you create a certain enzyme, it has to be exactly like that. 100% of them will be identical to this. If one thing changed, it did this, it's no, no good anymore. It had to be right there. It's got to be there. That's it. Case closed. Now, what does it do? It roams through your body in your blood. And what does it do as it roams through your body? It looks for something that has a chemical magnetic O2, O3, or whatever it's going to be. And it says, hey, you and I, we can work together. And it comes over and it goes, click. And it clicks exactly to that pattern of molecules. And it changes it into something good that you can use. It, it breaks down food. It kills bacteria that's trying to invade you. It's a clicker. It, it's, it's, it's got a really fancy job to do. And as long as you have this, and it's roaming around your body, it can click. Why would you not have some of these very fancy little proteins? They're, they're made by enzymes. Well, why wouldn't you have them? Enzymes are made by bacteria. Bacteria is vulnerable in your body. Antibact antibiotics kill bacteria. Certain foods will kill the bacteria. And there's a lot of this uh, genetically modified food which resists these plants resist toxins, but they take them in. They won't die, but you're going to eat them, and you, they're, they're in that plant. So when they're genetically modified to say, I don't care, you can give me chemistry that will kill plants. I don't care about it. You're not going to kill me because I'm genetically modified, but I'll eat that stuff, and I'll absorb it. So the plant will absorb it. Then your body says, whoa, I'm not immune to that. You're feeding me with all this glyphosate and all these things that are going to kill the biology in me and I don't know how to stop that. So that's what I'm a little worried about is that some of this genetically modified foods are letting things into your body that will kill you, that will try to kill your bacteria. And if you kill your bacteria, that little thing that was supposed to go out and do its click chemistry to make your carrots turn into some something that makes you grow, it comes out and it's not there. The carrots don't do anything. They just come in, they go out. That's why people have digestive issues, really problems with digesting food. They don't have the bacteria. They don't have the enzymes. No clicks. All right, so what is my claim? My claim is that this specific area right here is, is, is designated, literally designated, to transitioning molecules through your body to support your life. And these are the colors, and I say they're in blood. And, oh, Roger, can you prove that? Yes, I can. All right, that's a heart. It's an opal heart. And remember I told you before, this is a heart? This is also a heart. And all of these little strings and heart strings and ventricle walls and all this different architecture that's in here would have taken on colors had it been in the place where this was. And why did this take on these colors? I showed you all of those colors of these transition molecules or elements. And where are they found? They're found in the blood. So we're now we, these are in your blood. Well, if you stay saturated with blood and in the right conditions, every single bit of like this, this is some kind of collagen. This is boom, boom, boom. You got your muscles all around here. You've got your heart strings and your ventricle walls and your aorta and all these different valves and so forth. Well, they all have different chemistry. That's why this thing here turned blue. That didn't turn blue. Why? Different chemistry. 
That didn't turn blue. Why? Different chemistry. In the blood, this is the plasma, which has all of the molecules of these transition metals. It's just I showed you, and I showed you the colors, and there they are, and they would be floating through your body. Simple as that. This was up that side. This was down. Specific gravity says metals are heavier than, than this, the plasma. So that would rise to the top. The metals would drain to the bottom. Well, well they'd lay more or less on the bottom. But in this, something had to be continuously moving these metals in, in here and not letting them get too far away. And just continuously looking for their, until they eventually, everybody found its own part. Now, in some places, it, might, it was invaded by something a little bit different. You see the green is over here? Now, whatever invaded right here might have been from, like, a um, pancreas or something close to the heart that, w that has a different chemistry, a very much different chemistry. So a lot of sulfur, or a lot of copper, a lot of, some other transition metals. So they invaded primarily right in this area right here. All right, I hope that makes sense to you. But this is a heart. That's a heart. And they can come in. I, everybody's got uh, the hearts coming out of your ears. And I think this was a heart too, or this could have been a liver. When it's, it's completely red like that. I got another one over here somewhere. It's completely red. But anyway, uh, it's some kind of an organ. And again, it, they, this is nucleophilic substitution. That's right, I was going to tell you about that too. Hold on a second. I make all these promises and I forget. <laughs> Speaking of forgetting, I almost forgot to show you the, the feldspar that's in my meteorite. There's the meteorite right there. Everything burns off, all the cheap stuff. And, but you still have some of that fabric from the feldspar. That's the, that's the tough stuff that keeps it stretchy. Now I put a little water on here. I'm going to show you that the blood vessels are, there's still blood in there. And this came through space. Uh, it's magnetic, but you can see all of the characteristics of, of the feldspar. And, and it is a lung. All these little holes are lung holes. Now, I, I could put a little uh, hydrogen peroxide probably on here and see a reaction. I did the other day and I got some. You, you don't get a lot because heat denatures the, the enzymes. It's just like in your body when you get a temperature. When you get too hot, I believe the enzymes don't work correctly you, because at a certain temperature you got a problem. And the same thing coming through the atmosphere, this thing would burn up. Well, it did. But it still has some very obvious characteristics of the feldspar. See, that's it right there. Now, I suppose I should put a little hydrogen peroxide on here just to... I'm going to put some on, and if it reacts, I will show you the reaction. How's that sound? All right, I'm going to put some hydrogen peroxide in here. But before I do, let's talk about catalase, because this is why I'm putting the hydrogen peroxide in. You see this elegant, elegant, elegant molecule? You see that? That's catalase. And it's got to be exactly that configuration, identical, 100% of the time. It doesn't work. What happens to destroy it is, is if you don't have the bacteria, you can't create the enzyme. Because this is created by, by a bacteria. A bacteria is a factory that creates different enzymes. They all create a different enzyme. So, and every enzyme does a different job. Catalase gets rid of oxygen. You see this? Catalase is an anti-oxidant enzyme. An enzyme, every enzyme is created from bacteria in your body. And they're present in all aerobic, means air-breathing organisms. It's known to catalyze, which means break down, H2O2, which is not, which is what I'm going to be putting on there. I'm going to be putting on H2O2 on this um, blood. And if the blood has its enzyme, which they do, they're present in everything that has blood in it, it should convert it into water and oxygen, so it'll bubble up. Right away, I mean, very quick, and it does a good job, but it has to be like that. Now, let me explain to you 
about enzymes and bacteria right now because a bacteria and they, you have thousands of species and people's bacteria are being destroyed by a lot of different reasons but here's what a bacteria does it squirts out this all that chain and what happens to that chain it does this and when it's done it looks just like that and it will look every single one of them look identical to this no difference whatsoever thousands and probably millions of particles all you got to do is change one move it just a hair it's over it's done case is closed what would do that heat heat will destroy enzymes that's the number one thing then they have antibiotics and well if you don't have the biotic you anti it out, you killed it, which is your bacteria, you're not going to get the enzyme. It's as simple as that. So you got, and then there's other things that attack bacteria that are like um, weed killers and things like that. Agent Orange, that's what happened with Agent Orange. I was in the Army in, um, in 1968. And this was the time of Vietnam. It was the time of Tet and all that stuff. I went right in during Tet. And I got sick in the Army. Not, I wasn't working with Agent Orange or any of that stuff. But I did remember one thing that happened was very unusual. To me, it was unusual. I had such a high temperature. They literally packed me in ice to bring the temperature down. I guess, I guess at some point, it, they say it damages your organs and so forth. Well, I never gave it much thought. But I think it must damage the bacteria. The bacteria, at a certain temperature, they become denatured. The enzymes don't work. And, if, and you, you dependent upon every, every bacteria in your body 24 hours a day to break down the products and then keep you immune from being invaded. So I think the temperature increase made my bacteria vulnerable. That's, I'm starting to think that now. I'm looking at bacteria as basically the, the reasons for almost everything in your body. Well, it is. Basically, it is. Without an enzyme, no chemistry happens. Almost none whatsoever. Almost zero. With an enzyme, boop, one enzyme, one molecule, one of these fancy little buggers like that, can convert millions of other molecules in a second. Click chemistry. It transfers at the speed of light because this is all magnetic. It finds its particles, it goes, bloop, and bloop. every one of these other molecules has the same signature that this is supposed to attach to. They all happen at once. That's why you, they're so fast. I mean, it's unbelievable how fast the enzymes do their job. This is all biology. And if you don't understand all of these different facets, you can't understand rocks, you can't understand minerals, you can't understand biology, you can't understand history. You can't understand geology, you can't understand any of that stuff. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Until you understand, first of all, the nature of the particles we're dealing with, because that's not even understood. I, I mean, it, it, there's so many things here that we need to look into, but let's just go back to my meteorite, which I told you I would show you if it bleeds, if it sends off some oxidation or not. We'll find out in a second. Yep, there's no question whatsoever. There was the, the enzyme catalase is in this blood vessel, which is in this meteorite. You see all those? That's oxygen being liberated from the H2O2 and the, the liberating molecule is catalase. Catalase is an enzyme. An enzyme is created by a bacteria. A bacteria is there to protect you from these invasive oxygens. What they will do is they'll destroy the molecules in your body, the cells, they'll, they'll disrupt everything. So it, it has to convert them into water. Look at this. We're talking some serious chemistry there. Now I'm just going to keep keep an eye on it. I'm going to back out of here and you'll see. I'm going to back it up way up here. I'm going to look way down. You see, you don't hardly see it from way up here. Hold on. And then you got this glare in there. But when you get right down on it, you can see that thing is just bubbling like crazy.
You see it? All that white fuzzy stuff. That's all air bubbles. That's all air bubbles coming out of there. And this is that meteorite. So if it's coming through space with all these bubbles and the catalase, I would say that there's still probably some kind of DNA in there. Now, I have another meteorite here that's a, a, a stony one. This is a, a, a iron one or a, a metal one. When they say iron, they're not iron. They're, they're all the different metals that are in your body. I showed you all the different colored metals. They're all of those. And when they cut them open, you can see all the separate crystalline patterns. And you can still see the blood. Watch this. All right, now watch this. As I told you, everything can turn into anything. This lung here is all quartz now. You see that? That's the latch that I talk about. That little latch is right there. Now, it's eroded away because all of the fascia is gone. And it, it would have been there, though, but it left that. This still has the latch here. Look at this. This is a lung also. There's a latch. That's a lung. That's where they, of some kind. I don't know, a chipmunk or something. I don't know what it was. <laughs> but I'm going to put this in a microscope, and I'll show you. That's the latch. They all have a latch. Now, this is the one that came through space. It is also a lung, and it also has a latch. Now, I'm going to put it in a microscope, and I'll show you the latch. It's kind of cooked off, but you can see it quite well. This one here didn't cook. This was a terrestrial one, but that's, it's a totally different, a different matter, a different material. And it, it holds that lung in position so that you can float around and jump and run and do all these kind of things. But it will always come back to where it's anchored because of that latch. All right, And there's all kinds of other anchors in your body that I've studied them very, very well. But we're going to see that latch here in this lung that came through space. All right, don't forget, I'm saying that every body part holds into another body part by these little latches. And I call them locks, spur locks. All right, and that's what I showed you. And here I'm going to show you the same thing here that's in the tip of this. You, you can't see it because it's covered with the pleura. But the one up in the microscope, you will be able to see quite well. And the one that's in the microscope is this one right here, which is the, the um, one from space. And the way up here is the telescoping microscope. So we're looking. We're going to be looking down at it, and here it is in the microscope. Now, I have to turn the lights on. All right. Now, it'll take a second for it to settle in. And the light has to find its correct frequency. All right. There's that latch. There's that latch, and this is the lung that came through space. All right, there's the latch that's on the tip of the lung, the bottom of the lung, just like the other one has. All right, now, here's the lung on the side where all the alveoli is. You see that? Those are all the alveoli. That's just a, just a normal lung, only it came through space. You see? And it's a little wet because I just, you know, wet makes everything come out. You can see it. That's a lung. And it has all of those fibers and fabrics, and I, I think I showed you that it was, I think it was over in here somewhere, it was bubbling like crazy. Absolutely. It's saturated with enzymes. If the enzymes are there, it means it never got cooked so bad that it killed all the life in it. That's what it means. All right, I'm going to wrap it up with this, but this is another lung. Now, I cut this open. All right, there's that little latch. Whoops, you can't see it, can you? All right, now, I cut it open, and you see the shiny parts, and then you see the dull-looking parts. The dull-looking parts are where the red blood ran through, and the shiny-looking parts are where the different crystals have filled in the alveoli holes. You see? Anyway, I'm just going to leave it at this. I, I, I'm... I'm on this stuff pretty good now. I don't think anybody can uh, can can deny what I'm saying. Or at least I'd like them to try. That's what I've been asking for. I just want them to try to debunk what I am saying. That's all. Blood, you can get all the blood you want out of rocks. You see that? That's a that's a rock. It bled. Now that, it bled actually red blood came out of them. And they, these qualities are born, bone foramen. And they have um, 
they clot just like they, you clot when you get a, a scab. Here's what happened after I pulled the red blood off. This this is the fibrin. It's a clotting fabric that it, uh, it lets you do your scab over. And then when I took that out of the way, here's the holes. There's the black one. That, see the black vein right here? That's the black vein. This is the red one. That's the red artery. And that's what runs through those bones so that you can connect one bone to another bone through these holes. Uh, and the blood just see, leaks out of them. And they, they're saturated with blood. And they're touting, oh, we found this DNA, we found that DNA. Well, I don't know how to get through to anybody to listen to what I have to present. But what I have to present is valid. It's, and I have DNA tests and all that stuff. So, until this is examined, everybody else is walking around in circles. Once you examine it and you say yes or no, then we move forward. That's all. Okay, I mentioned I was going to talk about nucleophilic substitution. Here it is right here. This is what your whole body works on all day long, is nucleophilic substitution. You have a class of chemical reactions in which an electron-rich chemical species known as a nucleophile comes in and replaces a functional group within another electron deficient molecule known as the electrophile. It's coming in and sending out the garbage, it's bringing new stuff in. Electron rich means it's got some reactivity to it. Electrons are, are, are energy. That's what nucleophilic substitution is. <clears throat> and at a certain point, if the stuff is going to rot, it's just going to rot. But if it can continuously be washed with chemicals that have nucleophiles um, that that will attach and replace the other ones. That's what all that oxidation states, all that stuff. You need to know a little bit of chemistry to understand this, but just trust me. They come in and replace the stuff that's there and then it becomes stable. That's all.